Hi everyone and welcome to the next part on optimization for machine learning. This one is going to be a little bit more theoretical or conceptual, but I think we are going to cover a very important um, topic, which is going to be convergence rates. And so even though you can do this very, very theoretically and, and prove convergence rates and, and study this in a very detailed mathematical fashion, but this is not the goal here. The goal is merely to you know, get to know the idea and understand that this is a really, really important concept also for practical considerations. Right? So, and the, the central question, I've written it down already, is can we quantify how fast a method converges to W star, so the optimal weight vector? And we have seen in the past couple of videos, there are several ingredients, you know, you have to pick a descent direction, you have to pick a step length, you have to decide whether you compute the entire gradient or maybe using SGD only, you know, take a stochastic subsample to make this faster. But underlying all these questions is really this question, how quickly do we converge to the optimum, right? How computationally efficient is the specific algorithm that we have picked? And this short video is all about studying a few or getting to know a few different classes of convergence rates. And then in the next few videos, we will also discuss some changes to stochastic gradient descent and gradient descent to show that we have improved convergence rates. And so even though we don't need to really understand the mathematical details in full to implement such a method, knowledge of different convergence rates and of how useful it is to have higher convergence rates is really, really important for algorithm selection in the end. And so what is this about? There's the magic word is sequences, right? So it's a very basic mathematical topic, but this is really what it's all about, the study of sequences. And this is something where, where this idea of convergence also comes from. It doesn't necessarily have to do with optimization, but this idea of sequences is really what, what underlies all of this. And so what we are going to study is a sequence created by this optimization algorithm, but not of the weights themselves, but of the error. And error is somewhat misleading in this case. Oh, sorry. It's somewhat misleading in this case um, because what I mean by error here is epsilon, which is the difference between my current iterate wi, so this is what my algorithm creates, and then I subtract the optimal value, okay? So error, I mean, if I converge to the optimum, this error term goes to zero, right? If wi approaches w star, then this one gets smaller and smaller and will approach zero in the end. So if this error decays, then I do have an optimal solution in the end. And so now is the question really, what about the rate of convergence? Um, what do I mean by this? And so let's just put in the formal definition first. And then study a few different ways to realize this. Okay? So what I mean by the rate of convergence is in what way the norm of this quantity changes over the iterations. Okay? And so the convergence rate, what I'm going to say here is the definition is epsilon i or its norm is in the ith iteration smaller or equal to some alpha times the epsilon in the iteration before to the power of r. Okay. So what this rate really tells us is in what relation does the epsilon, so the error in the next iterate, stand to the error in the previous iterate, okay? And so this factor r is really what determines how quickly this converges, right? And so before we um, you know, slow, lose ourselves in all sorts of mathematical details, let's study three cases that are most important and that we can observe in optimization, right? You can have all sorts of of rates in general sequences, but for our case, three cases are really, really important, right? And so let's list them. So 
So in case number one is the linear case. Okay. Linear, which means R is one. And so now let's look at this. And what I mean by this is that epsilon at the ith iterate divided by epsilon at the iterate before is smaller than alpha. Okay, so r is one, I've just divided by this one here. If it's not zero, this is obviously possible and positive, so I can just do it. Um, and so you see that this alpha remains. And so does this converge for all sorts of alphas? Now think about setting alpha equal to two, which means the new error is twice as large as the previous one. So obviously no. In the linear case, we have an additional condition for this alpha, which has to be in the open interval between zero and one. So it means it can be arbitrarily close to one, but it doesn't have to be, uh, it is not allowed to be exactly one. One would obviously mean the error does not decrease. If this one is smaller than one, we do have a decrease, but it can become arbitrarily slow, okay? So what we have here as an example, right, and what I'm going to do now is I'm not using examples from optimization because this might take too long to set up. Let's just assume that I have created a sequence of weights using some sort of optimization algorithm that were of the type wi is one plus one half to the power of i. Okay, so you see clearly if i goes to infinity, so for arbitrarily many iterations, this one a half to the power of a very large number goes to zero, so this will be the w1. Uh, the, the w will converge to one. And so the error w i minus w star is just one half over i. And so if we now look at this ratio here, epsilon i divided by epsilon i minus one, and so I can omit the norms now because this is a positive number anyway, this would be a half to the power i divided by one half to the power one less, which gives us a half. Okay, so this type of sequence would satisfy a linear convergence rate. Okay, so it means the error decreases, the factor alpha here is precisely one half. So it will go towards zero, but not necessarily at a particularly fast rate. And so this is what, for instance, we can show for gradient descent. It has a linear convergence rate. And so you see, you know, it's guaranteed to descend, but we also talked about step sizes and so on. So this can become arbitrarily slow. And so what we can find as a, an improved version is what is called not quadratic. This will be case number three, but the next one is what we call superlinear. Right? And what do we mean by this? It's not precisely in this setting by setting the R to a specific value, but by demanding something in addition. So what we're going to ask is that in the limit of I going to infinity, that this ratio, epsilon, so the error in the ith iteration divided by the error in the i minus first iteration, that this approaches zero. Okay, so what it really means is, you see here, this is not the case, right? If I fix i to a million, a billion, whatever, this will always be one half. So no matter how large I make the i, this one will not go to zero in, in, in my example I had here. So it's not a superlinear conversion. This one means superlinearity. And so you see what is the advantage. At some point, this alpha will go to zero. And so that mean, at some point, you will have accelerated convergence, right? So superlinearity obviously means that you are quicker because this alpha has to become arbitrarily small in the limit. So superlinearity is much, much better than linearity um, because of this factor that over time you are guaranteed to have a very, very small um, alpha ratio, so a massive reduction of the error. And so in fact, this is something that is a lot better. We will come 
in our next videos to methods that have this superlinear property. Um, but before we get there, let's talk about the third one. Oh no, uh, let's not jump ahead of ourselves. Let's also study an example here. Again, it's a made up example because in optimization, this can become really challenging and these are detailed proofs to show how this actually satisfies superlinear convergence properties. But what we can show here is again, a very simple example just to you know, emphasize how this looks. So let's consider that our sequence now satisfies one plus one over i to the power of i. Okay. And so clearly this also has um, one as its, um, as its uh, the point it converges to. And so what we see is if we now again study this ratio here, what we will have is this one is i to the power of i because we subtract the, the one. Oh, excuse me. This is in the denominator. This is i to the power of i. And here we have i minus 1 to the power of i minus 1, right? And so what we can see is that this one also will go towards zero, right? We can add, subtract the i minus 1 here. So this is i minus 1 divided by i to the power of i minus 1 times 1 over i. So all I've done is I've, you know, taken 1 out so that we have this fraction. And you see this one, if i goes to infinity, this one goes very close to 1, but it's smaller than 1. So this one is going to be um, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's bounded, it cannot blow up. And you have 1 over i, so this one goes to infinity, so this one will go to 0. We see, so this sequence has a super linear convergence, right? So in the limit, if i goes large, this one will um, be arbitrarily close to 1, but this one will take us to 0, so this ratio of improvement will go to 0 in the end superlinear convergence for this, as I said. It's not an optimization example, just to emphasize this one will go to zero much, much quicker than this one in the end. And so let's conclude with the third one that is really, really important for optimization. And then I will make a few concluding comments and we continue in the next video with, with a method that satisfies this one here. And this is quadratic convergence. So what it really means is that epsilon i divided by epsilon i minus 1 squared is smaller than alpha. Okay, so now I don't need this additional condition because the square takes care of this. But you really, this is in the spirit of this formula, right? So r is equal to 2 in our quadratic convergence setting. And this one is really, really powerful because if you look at this a little bit, then you will see that the number of correct digits doubles in every iteration. Okay, approximately, the alpha plays a role in this. But think of this, I have 10 to the minus two maybe, and or 10 to the minus two here, and I squared, which gives me 10 to the minus four. So two digits correct, if I have an error 10 to the minus two, or maybe the first digit is correct, the second one not, and then I take this to the power of two, so 10 to the minus two error becomes 10 to the minus four, becomes 10 to the minus eight, becomes 10 to the minus 16. And so you see this converges very, very quickly. So this is, let's say, the holy grail in optimization because it doesn't get any better than this. We will talk about Newton's method in the next video where we see a method that does have this property, but it comes with some strings attached. So it's not the optimum for, for machine learning for other reasons that we will see there. But so here, I hope that you now have a, a bit of a better intuition what really convergence rates means that it really all comes down to the study of sequences and that we have these three cases. 
Usually what we have in machine learning is linear convergence rates, or you can show for some momentum-based algorithms, um, higher order convergence rates, but these come usually with theoretical you know, assumptions that are not necessarily always satisfied for uh, deep learning, in particular convexity of the objective function, but nevertheless, so, right? so if you want to go into machine learning research and study optimization, if you can find algorithms that are efficiently executable and in live in the domain of superlinear or even quadratic convergence, then this will be a huge benefit for, for also practical considerations. And so with this, I will stop here and hope that you have you know, gained a little bit of interest also in studying sequences, even though it seems ex abstract, it's really also highly relevant for practical applications. See you in the next video.